It's December, and as tradition, we talk about DOS. And today I'm answering the question, how do we write a DOS game? In this video, I'm showing you a project that I started some years ago, but then abandoned without completing it. A clone of the Bomberman game that runs on DOS and able to run on an Olivetti M24. Let's start by taking a look at the Olivetti M24 specs. It has an Intel 8086 CPU with 16 bits clocked at 8 MHz, 640 KB of RAM, a CGA compatible video card. We'll, we'll use the glorious 300 by 200 resolution with a whopping 4 colors. For the sound, it has the PC speaker that can output very annoying square wave beeps. So forget about any kind of polyphony. And as an input device, we'll simply use the computer's keyboard. Let's begin with the graphics. On the web, there's a very good website called the Spriters Resource that provides the spreadsheets of most 2D games. So I took the spreadsheet of the Bomberman game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, and with GIMP I changed the colors in order to obtain the full colors available on the CGA. Side note, not many people know that it's not true that the four colors on the CGA are cyan, magenta, white and black if you're using the cold palette, and red, green, yellow and black if you're using the warm palette. Turns out that instead of black, you can use any of the 16 colors that are available in text mode. As a result, for my Bomberman clone, I chose the cold palette with cyan, magenta and white, but instead of black, I'm using green. Once obtained the PNG with the CGA colors, we need, for convenience, extract every single sprite into distinct images, and for this I wrote a little Python tool called extractiles.py. This tool and the next one require Python 3 and the Pillow library that allows us to manipulate images very easily. Now that we have one image per animation frame, we can create our spreadsheets with a format that is similar to the CGA video memory layout, and to do so I made the makeCGA.py tool. As the CGA uses 2 bits per pixel, that is 4 pixels per byte, first I'm producing the byte that contains the first pixels, and this is done by the byteFromImage function. Then, given that the CGA memory layout is interlaced, I'm writing the file first with the even lines, and then with the odd lines. This will allow us to show the image faster and with fewer operations. Let's now get to the music. Jim Leonard, also known in the demo scene as Trickster, wrote a really cool tracker for DOS and PC speaker called Monotone. If you know the 8080 HMPH demo, there, its music was written precisely with monotone. And it so happens that the 8080 HMPH music is there in monotone's repository and it's called swinging1.mon. Now, if I press Ctrl W, I can write to a file a dump of the values that I need to write to the timer in order to play this tune. The game expects this file to be called game.snd. Lastly, let's get to the game's code. I wrote everything in the C programming language, without any assembly, not even for the interrupt handlers or for the parts that interface directly with the hardware. As we just talked about music and timers, let's take a look at the timer.c file. On line 6, we see a pointer to an integer called music that contains the game.snd file contents, which, as previously stated, is a list of values to be written to the timer. The iMusic variable is the current index inside the array, and lenmusic is the array's length. The magic happens in the int08 function, which, as the name suggests, is the interrupt handler, that is the timer. It works like this. Channel 0 of the timer usually is used to update the system's date and time, about 18 times a second. 
I quadrupled this channel's frequency in order to change the speaker's frequency about 72 times a second. Given that I quadrupled the frequency, every four interrupts, I'm calling the original interrupt handler in order for the system date and time to remain correctly updated. Side note, this explains why, after playing some DOS games, sometimes you had the system date and time completely wrong. Either the game's programmers forgot to call the original interrupt handler for interrupt 8, or they forgot to restore the correct frequency to the timer channel 0 at the exit of the game. But let's look at the interesting part of the interrupt handler. I'm writing the value of music on channel 2 of the timer, which is directly connected to the PC speaker, which results in the speaker beeping with the frequency that I just set. Let's now go to the keyboard. Unfortunately, the quote-unquote standard KB hit and get CH functions of the C compilers for DOS are not enough, because while they tell us that the key gets pressed, they don't tell us when a key gets released. We need to program the keyboard at a low level then. In the keyboard.c file, we see that when a key gets pressed or released, it generates the interrupt 9. In the interrupt 9 handler, I read the port 60 hex that tells me which key has been pressed or released. And I'm simply writing the value 1 or 0 in the key tracker array at the index corresponding to the key that has been pressed or released. This way, I have all the information I need. If from the previous key tracker value the key goes from 0 to 1, it means that the key has been pressed, while if from the previous value to the current one it goes from 1 to 0, it means that the key has been released. This also means that while I'm reading 1 in the key tracker, it means that the key is being held pressed. Meanwhile, in the keyboard.h file, I assigned a name for every scan code read from the port 60 hex to which key it corresponds. Let's take a look at the video.c file. Although the Whatcom compiler has some routines for handling the graphics at a high level, given that I wrote the interrupt handlers for the speaker and keyboard, I wanted to handle the CGA graphics at a low level as well. Here's then that the set video mode and set palette functions call the interrupt 10 that is provided by the video card's BIOS. The wait for vblank function waits for the CRT controller to be in the vertical retrace state, and this obviously occurs at the video refresh frequency, which in case of CGA mode 4 is 60 Hz. This function would be called at every frame inside the game loop to obtain a constant frame rate that is independent of the processor speed. Side note. Many of the older PC games did not synchronize the game's frame rate with the CRT controller, but they assumed that the game would always run on a 4.77 MHz 8088, which resulted in these games becoming unplayably fast if they were executed on faster machines. This is also the reason why many 286 and 386 PCs had a turbo button that slowed down the processor and made it run at a speed comparable to a 4.77 MHz 8088, but I'm digressing too much. Let's get back to our video.c and the draw image function. I put a compile flag called useBackBuffer, where if set to 1, I'm writing the image in an array in RAM, and later this array will be copied into video memory by the updated screen function. If useBackBuffer is set to 0, I write directly to video RAM. Here we see that the video memory is at the B800 hex segment, but beware. If you remember the Python files, we divided the image into even lines and odd lines. This is because the CGA video memory is interlaced. So, starting from offset 0, you'll find the even lines, and starting from offset 2000 hex, you'll find the odd lines. As a result, this function has two loops, one for the even lines and one for the odd lines. And all the bit shifts that you see are due to the fact that in one byte there are 4 pixels, 
And if the image that I want to show doesn't have an X value that is multiple of four, I need to shift it in order to show it at the coordinates that I want. Another side note, here I wrote a single function that calculates how much to shift the image and always performs the shift and end operations, even if they are not needed. I have seen games that, apart from implementing this routine in assembly, have two separate functions, one for the values that are multiples of four and one for the other values, so that the CPU doesn't waste precious cycles if the image is on a coordinate multiple of four. Next, the clear area function works exactly like draw image, but it simply zeroes out an area inside the video memory. The read image function reads either from the back buffer or directly from video RAM and puts the resulting image in an array that has been passed as a parameter. Lastly, the update screen function. If I set to 1 the used back buffer flag, it copies a portion of the back buffer to the video RAM. And if I set the use back buffer flag to zero, this function does nothing. Let's conclude the code analysis with the main.c file. The map variable contains the map of the game. The letter W stands for wall and specifies an indestructible wall. And the letter B stands for brick. Let's skip a bunch of details, and inside our main, we see that I'm doing a lot of calls to load resource, that simply loads the contents of a file inside an array. Then I set the video mode and initialize the timer, speaker, and keyboard. Now I show the initial map on screen. Let's go directly to the game loop, and we see that to exit the loop, you can either press ESC or Q. Then there's the wait for vblank for synchronizing the game's frame rate that we talked about before. Here's that while one of the directional arrow keys is pressed, I move the player. And here we see how I handle a key transition. If in the previous frame the space key wasn't pressed, but now it is, then I place a bomb. After that, I save the current state of the space key as the previous state for the next frame. Now, let's skip a bunch of game logic, otherwise this video will, would be several hours long. And let's get to the end of the loop. I draw the player character at its coordinates. Then this rect union calculates the area of the player in the previous frame and in the current one. And lastly, I actually write on video RAM only that area. Given that my target is an Olivetti M24, I can't afford to redraw the whole screen at every frame. So, in order to achieve a decent performance, I must update only the parts in video RAM that have actually changed compared to the previous frame. After exiting the main loop, I restore the original interrupt handlers for keyboard, timer and speaker, and I go back to the initial video mode. Let's not forget to free the memory allocated by the files. Very well, now all we have to do is compile this game source code. To do so, we need to use the OpenWatcom compiler that we easily find in the FreeDOS distribution. This compiler works very well on DOSBox. And first of all, we need to execute the owsatemf.bat file in order to have all the environment variables required by the compiler correctly set. Then all we need to do is the wmake slash a command for compiling everything. Now in the out directory, in addition to the graphics and music, we also have our executable game.exe. If we want, we could execute game.exe directly from DOSBox, but I want to show you how this game runs on an Olivetti M24 emulated by 86box.
Yeah, as you can see, other than moving the player around and placing some bombs, there is not much more. I told you that I abandoned this project without completing it. On the other hand, I think that I still reached a good point from the technical point of view, and I hope to have satisfied your curiosity on how to write a DOS game nevertheless. Thanks for watching! You can find this video both on YouTube and on Odyssey. You can find all the links in the description. Please like and comment this video. I would tell you to subscribe to my channel, but almost all my videos are in Italian. Nevertheless, if you understand Italian and you like Linux programming and retro computing, subscribe to my channel as well. See you in the next video. Ciao! In order to pay this... I'm writing the in... And this, obviously, of course, at the video...